This is my Citroen C6, which I paid £750 for in lockdown, uh, September 2020. Why did I pay £750 for a Citroen C6, you might ask? And you might also be asking, why is it indoors in a dank workshop? Why is it not outside in natural light where we can see it? Well, quite predictably, it's broken. Uh, the reason it's on the ramp is because I'm doing the third of three main jobs that caused this car to be £750. So before I go delving into what I've done with the car, I'll tell you how I got the car, why I got the car, how it came about, why it was £750, and how it is now. Right, it would be best to pull up a chair, although I imagine you probably already sat down. Who watches YouTube stood up? The year is 2020. It's not, but it was. And I, at the time, was driving around in a Citroen C4 VTS Coupe. Uh, that car was at the um, Hubnut Brooklyn Social. It was the C4 that was there. And I ended up selling that to a friend because I got the C6. More on that later. It was the funky three-door coupe that they do, uh, or did. And it was the VTS. It was 180 horsepower petrol. So it was their effort at um, a hot hatch. Not really that hot, if I'm honest. 180 horsepower, uh, or 173, as I actually turned out to be, in a 1,350 kilo car. Not really a lot. So it was a very revvy engine, cylinder head developed by Lotus, apparently. It wasn't the most fun thing to drive. Uh, the handling was not amazing, but it was just a nice car. Good stereo, good seats, good aircon, yada, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, I thought of it as a practical coupe as opposed to a hot hatch, and then it started to make a bit of sense. Quite happy with that car. And then a friend of mine, uh, Simon, not the one I often refer to as a knobhead, the other one, uh, he brought up the idea of getting a C6. And we thought, that's a good idea. So well, we could go halves on a C6 and then like you could drive it. Sometimes I could drive it. Sometimes we can share the repair bills. A C6 is a car I'd always wanted, but I knew going in at the bottom end of the market was risky. So we found a C6 on eBay. I forget, it was iron gray. I think it had a stoved in door. I mean, there was warning signs all over it. It might as well have had arrows pointing down and flashing. We were gonna bid on it, but I predicted that the bidding would go above what we wanted to pay and so it did a bit dejected never mind didn't really need one anyway there was something else going on in 2020 taking our attention i forget what and we went on with our lives but having just had my appetite whetted i went on facebook and for some reason i forget which group it was i saw this car uh, a chap was advertising it as spares or repair um he uh, he basically said it needed work and he'd gone as far as he wanted to go with putting money into it. He'd had it a long time, done a lot of miles in it, and he went as far as he wanted to go, fair enough. So I messaged him, there was no price on it, but I messaged him um, and then forgot about it, basically. Eventually, I, I got back to him. He did reply and I got back to him and talked to him and said, you know, what's up with it, blah, blah, blah. And he said the things that are wrong with it. And I said, what kind of figure were you wanting Bearing in mind that our budget, for, combined budget for this one on eBay was about 1400 I think. And it ended up going for 19 So I thought, oh, it might be about 1500 mm. And he said, uh, well, I was going to put it on eBay with a reserve of 800 But if it's not going on eBay and it's going to a club member, I think it was Citroen Car Club, you'd have it for 750 What? And basically, he, he, he knew what he was talking about. He, he'd done his own work. He knew how much it would cost to put right if you were paying to do it. And uh, he knew also that he could sell it for more on eBay. This is quite a noble thing for him, really. Um, certain, you know, cars need people like this. He knew he could put it on eBay and get 1,500 quid for it because he knew it would go spares or repairs. It would go to a breaker. It would go to a breaker either in the UK or in Europe. So it would be a doomed thing. And he didn't want that. He wanted it to go to a good home. It was kind of like you can have it cheap but on the proviso that you do actually fix it and it does continue to live on. So this was music to my ears, because of course I thought, well, I could probably fix it, hopefully. And um, so I was starting to do a bit of a deal there. Meanwhile, the Iron Grey C6 reappeared on eBay. Quel surprise. A bit of a time waster, apparently. Mm. So it reappeared on eBay. Um, a friend, Simon, saw it. And I said, well, you should buy it as well. We could both have one, because I'd kind of stitched him up and bailed out and bought that one on my own. And uh, yeah, you should go and do that. So he started bidding on that, but it did go above what he wanted to pay. Meanwhile, I should say, meanwhile, 
This here, I'm in conversation with the owner, I agree to pay the money, quite happy with that. He wants to drive it down. So he lives in Reading somewhere and he wants to deliver it to me for, 800, for 750 quid. But he just wanted one more drive in it. Okay, brilliant. So um, he also asked if he could take it to a car show, uh, a Citroen show, the week before. I was, yeah, knock yourself out, just, you know. So I got this car in September 2020. He came, he dropped it off. I wired him the money, took him back to the station, job done. Uh, the other car that my friend had failed to win on eBay because it went above his budget got picked up by someone who follows me on Twitter. That car overheated and blew up on the way home from picking it up. So um, that was a bit of a, a bullet dodged. And the Citroen C6s are quite complex cars. I know, right? Because of that, although they are at heart, and the best description of a C6 I've ever heard was on the Beige Forum, um, and it was uh, it's just a Peugeot 407 with gas bag suspension. So although it's hardware-wise a fairly standard car, a fairly normal car, in many other ways it's not. It's quite a complex car and you have to know the subtle differences between them. Um, so for that reason, to get it repaired might have cost X. But to get it repaired by a specialist, of which there aren't many in the country, someone who knows the cars and knows what they're doing, well, that would cost why. So he was quite happy for me to take the car on and deal with the issues myself. I said, well, I don't know my way around them, but I'll learn for 750 quid. I'll find out, All right? So I suppose the key question uh, on everyone's lips is how did I end up paying 750 pounds for a car that once retailed at 38,000? This particular car is, uh, it's a 2007. I know the number plate, I know, don't just trust me. Uh, it's a 2.7 litre HDI, which is an engine that most people run a million miles from. It's the one that's known for snapping crankshafts in Discoveries. They've got a very narrow crankshaft. It's a very narrow engine. So the uh, the webbing on it is quite thin and they have a habit of snapping in half, which causes a breakdown. So it's 24 valve twin turbo, 200 and horsepower with a bit of change. And uh, torque is uh, lots, 300 and 20 pound foot, something like that, at quite low revs. Um, turbos are very vocal, you can hear them. Now this particular model, there were three trims of C6. There was the, just C6, there was the Lenage, and there was the exclusive. Now, just the basic C6, I'd, I've never seen one, or if I have, I didn't realize there was. Um, but for the Lenage and the exclusive, it's important to note the differences. Um, the Lenage is for peasants and the exclusive is for presidents. That's the easiest way to remember it. Um, the exclusive is the one with the wood, Makudu, Makodo, something like that. It's got lots of other gubbins. This one's also got added toys in it, such as a lounge pack, which means you can't fold the rear seats down anymore because they are electrically reclining and heated, which is useful. And uh, it's got a concert pack, which means it's got all JBL stuff in it. It's pretty much got everything. It's got the cream interior, which I'll show around uh, one day, and it's uh, finished in storm grey. Now I'll get into all the history and everything of the C6 in a future video. Maybe we'll do like a POV drive type thing, walk around, you know, whatever I can think of doing. But the one at the moment, the focus at the moment is how I got it, why it was cheap, what was wrong with it, and getting it right now. September 2020, I got the car. It's not September 2020 anymore. It's March 2022, and I still haven't finished fixing it. Um, it has been on the road. So when I got the car, it had a week's MOT. Why am I doing this too? It had a week's MOT left. And that was enough to just drive it around and go, ooh, brilliant, I own a C6. The reason, it, another reason it was cheap and reason it needed the repairs doing was that it wouldn't pass another MOT. Um, and that's because problem number one was the parking brake. Now the parking brake on one of these is electric, um, which a lot of people will run away from, but if you think about it, it actually makes sense, doesn't it? With everything else being so electric in them these days. Now, most cars that have electric handbrakes, or a lot of them have a little servo motor on the caliper, but this one doesn't. This is kind of old school. So what this has is a box that goes above the rear subframe. 
and out of this box there are cables. Those cables go to the rear calipers. So basically, instead of you yanking on a handbrake lever, you just push a button and that box pulls the cables instead. So there's a big motor in there and some gearing and it pulls both cables simultaneously. Now what happens, because these cars don't have their parking brake used very often, is the parking brake cable seizes. That causes the box of tricks there to have a duck fit and uh, it doesn't like it, it measures excessive torque required and in this car's case, it went to a spasm and would not release. It meant he had to cut the cable to be able to drive it again. So it wasn't just a case of freeing up the cable, the cable would be cut. So I'll get a new handbrake cable. No, a new handbrake cable, not available. Um, Citroen didn't sell them. So let's get another box, you say. Get another box, take it off another car. That's the second hand one. No, that's coded to the car. It has to be a virgin box. That is not my words, the words of Citroen. So I have to buy a new box from Citroen. That'll be a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds. Citroen did used to sell cables in a pair, and they're unavailable at the moment, and they were 300 for two cables. So, how did I get around that? That box of tricks there cost me £50 from a local guy who was breaking a C6. He bought one, a bit of a sad really to break them, but he, he bought one and it was a bit battered, the body was tired and he didn't really see any merit in spending the money to make it tidy. He might as well get his money back in bits and then buy another one. So that works out well for me because I bought this box. I took the cables out of this box, or one of the cables, because one of them's still in it, and hung it up and proceeded to pour engine oil down it. New engine oil, not old. Uh, repeat for a week and put a drill on it and span it round and try to really make this thing so free moving, you've never seen anything like it. Uh, and then, I tried to fit it to the car and that involved hooking the computer up, putting the handbrake in or parking brake into maintenance mode so it released the tension on the cables. And it was actually dead easy. Once I'd done that, I put the new cable in there, wound it up, got the tension, bang, parking brake was working for 50 quid. So that was a result. But that wasn't the big problem. There were two problems which were worrying me slightly more. Uh, of those two problems, uh, one of them is still, or well, potentially, has been sorted, but I won't find out just yet. Um, but uh, the second problem um, with the car was the suspension. Oh, I know, the troublesome suspension, hydraulics. It's quite a simple system. I know that sounds crazy saying that, but they are, in essence, actually quite simple to follow your way around. You figure out how they work, you can generally fault find them. This one, had an issue where I I would drive, I didn't know how smooth the C6 is supposed to be. Obviously I've driven lots of other Citroens. Didn't know how, how smooth these were supposed to be. Everyone waxes on about how amazing the ride is on them, but I don't know how good it is. So the first time I went in it, I was a little underwhelmed, but not massively. And basically he showed me the issue with the suspension where you drive down the road and the suspension would be okay. And then it would flash a message up on the uh, screen inside saying suspension faulty. So you think, oh, okay. And then it went firm. Now, it didn't go rock hard. It didn't go like a BX does when the spheres pop or something like that. It wasn't, it was more like driving a normal car. It was like driving an Audi or something like that. It was just a bit, it's just a bit firmer than you need really for bumpy crap roads. So definitely wasn't riding like one of these should ride. So that was one of the problems, but I didn't actually figure out what the issue with it was with that until I went on the excellent C6 owners forum. Um, that is an absolute treasure trove of information. Uh, these cars, cars like this, anything complex, the, these guys in these kind of environments, these forums, they are gold dust. They really are. Um, the information you can get and the things you can figure out how to put right, DIY, blow your mind. And one of the chaps had hooked up an oscilloscope to the uh, one of the um, control wires from the suspension ECU to figure out what was going on, what it was seeing. And what he realized was that after 30 seconds of driving, his car went into suspension faulty mode. And basically the, the fact it was going firm was like a safe mode. It was going into a, it was reverting to a safe mode. So the car normally can vary its own ride height depending on what kind of driving you're doing. But when it goes into a safe mode, it, it, basically it's saying, oh, I don't know, 
So it raises itself up a bit and it reduces its travel just in case. It doesn't want you to ground out or anything like that. So that's what it was doing. And he figured out that this car was doing it every 30 seconds. You'd come to a stop, it would reset, you drive off 30 seconds later, safe mode, suspension faulty, algae suspension, not good. But I saw that post and said, oh, that's, that is amazing detective work. I'm very impressed with that. However, mine doesn't do that. Mine doesn't wait 30 seconds. Pretty sure it doesn't wait 30 seconds. I should drive it and find out. So I did. Went out on a lunch break, drove the car. Sure enough, as soon as I started driving, started counting, it wasn't 30 seconds. Sometimes it was 34, sometimes it was 45, sometimes it was 50 something. It was always over 30. Didn't think anything of it. And until I got to a set of lights, got to a set of lights, pulled away. The road was smooth. There was a drain in the road, sunken. And I thought, okay, I'll count after I hit that, after I hit a bump, after the wheels have to do something, I'll start counting. 30 seconds, on the nose. Interesting. So why is it doing that, I wonder? Well, it all came down to a little piece of metal. This. This bracket was bolted onto the wishbone. And what comes off of it is a little linkage bar and that goes up to a height control sensor. There's one of these on each wheel, so four for those who can count. Um, I'll go into the complexities of how it all works and what they do in a future video. In fact, I'm thinking about doing one comparing all the different types of hydropneumatic suspension. But the important thing to note is that this bracket is just about, and you can see it maybe, there's that bit sticking down and there's another bit. They're not, Parallel. One is bent. It's bent about a millimetre and a half. That was enough to completely confuse the car because what I couldn't do originally was get the suspension to cooperate. And by that I mean I plugged my laptop into it and went to put in um, adjust and adjust the suspension settings. Now you do that by taking a set of measurements on the car telling the ECU and then the ECU goes, mm, okay, and it figures out an equation and it resets itself and it will like that. And then it will say yay or nay. Um, this kept saying nay, not complete, not happy, don't want to do it. Why not? So when I looked at the height figures, um, I forget what the actual figures were, but it was something like both rear wheels, 30 mil, near side front, 30 mil, this one minus 60. Apparently this was underground and uh, yeah, that's what led me to find out. Well, I actually went and bought a load of the brackets. So I went to the Citroen dealer well, and got them while I could. In fact, there's the passenger side there. It's not even been fitted because it was fine. Um, buy the bits for these things while you can because Citroen aren't going to be supporting them. Uh, they, they pretty much like to forget they made stuff like this, I think. So um, I, uh, I went down the dealer, bought new brackets. So I had a bracket, so I took the bracket off and compared it, and sure enough, found out it was bent by the smallest little fraction. So new linkage, new bracket, put it all back in, do the sequence again, suspension sorted. That's all it was. I think it was about nine pound. Um, the bracket was bent. You might also probably wondering why was the bracket bent? Um, it had had a CV boot by a normal garage, not from a Citroen specialist. And yeah, of course they've popped the ball joint, levered the arm down been bent. It's the same sort of bracket you'd have on a car that's got height adjustable headlights. On a Peugeot 407, that bracket bolts to a hole that does actually control the height adjustable headlights. Um, but so these cars don't have height adjustable headlights because they have height adjustable suspension. Suspension stays level, so the headlights don't ever end up pointing it like that. Unless the suspension's wrong, which it is at the moment and on a future video, I will show you how I sync the suspension because I have to do it. Because in another video that I'm going to put out there, which I've done already, I changed the suspension bushes and the geometry of the front wishbones. And that has completely ruined the suspension on that car again. So it all needs setting up again. But there are other things I have to do all in good time. I'm going to try and put all this into some sort of order. So that's two issues down. And that was enough to put the car on the road. Um, the car went on the road, went in for a new MOT. Um, October, I think it was, 2020 or November. 
uh, and I was able to tax the car. It's expensive. That said, I know it's not car tax, whatever, road fund license, whatever. It's a lot of money. It's like 550 quid a year. But, well, that sounds a lot of money. It is a lot of money. The C4 I was driving was 30 something pound a month. And on direct debit, this is about 54. Well, it sounds a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But it's only 20 odd quid more than the C4 was. My logic was, how many takeaways do I have every month? Three, four? I have one less. And drive a C6. It seems like, you know, takeaways are nice. We like takeaways, it's a little treat. But is it really worth it? Yes. Yes, it is. 100%. As soon as I drove that thing for the first time, oh yeah, it's worth not having a takeaway. So, got it in for the MOT. And um, bear in mind that the uh, tax is worked out and calculated on vehicle emissions. I was kind of annoyed to find that the car is so clean, the probe that went up the exhaust and the computer it's connected to couldn't detect that it was connected to the car to do the emissions test because it is that clean. That's quite annoying. Uh, it doesn't smoke at all. Flat out at night when other cars' headlights tend to illuminate what comes out the back of nothing. Honestly, there's nothing coming out the back of it. I think the air coming out the back of it is cleaner than the air going in. I'm filtering the atmosphere for people. They should be grateful. Anyway, so I put it on the road and um, there were a few little niggles um, along the way, but I basically just got to enjoy how the car should be. Not in its entirety, um, because the third issue wasn't one that prevented me from using the car much. Um, the third issue was the gearbox. The gearbox had a fault, and it's actually kind of a common fault in, in these cars with these gearboxes. This gearbox is used in a lot of different cars, not, not unique to this one at all. And basically, uh, when the car was cold, the gears worked fine. Gearbox worked quite happily, quite smoothly. Um, I imagine it's probably how it would work in perfect working order. But when the gearbox warmed up, as it tends to do, uh, that's when trouble started. And what would happen is you'd be driving down the road and pull away in first gear, a bit of a laboured pull away. It's, it's not something for just nipping out in traffic. It's awful at making a quick getaway. But it got even worse when it warmed up. First to second, not too bad, a bit clunky, but not, you know, not horrendous. And then came third. Third gear, about 21, 22 mile an hour. Revs are going up. Waits for it to hit. That's the rev counter. Waits for it to hit the point where it's going to change into third gear, and then the revs just go. Off they go. Like you've just dipped the clutch on a manual car. No gear at all. And then there's an almighty crash as the gear comes in into third, which resonates through the whole car. It's horrible. And it was actually captured um, when we went to get Betty. Ian captured it in his video, which I shall link to now. Yeah. So here we go, wafting away. Oh, bang. <laughs> oh, yeah, it does that. Yeah. Did, did, did I mention he paid £750 for this C6? But it, it mostly works. <laughs> that is uh, what it used to do. Um, horrible. Uh, for a car that has a weak crankshaft, that's not good. That's the problem it had. And he, uh, the previous owner, had been to a few places. He paid one place to do a gearbox flush on it. I'm not convinced they did an entire flush on it because the fluid I've drained out of it since was black. Um, but basically, it comes down to the fact that these boxes are known as sealed for life. And they aren't because nothing should be. As with anything, a lack of maintenance causes problems. And what happens is they have that issue. The other uh, symptom of it is when you go to put it in reverse, you, you'd stop, you put it in reverse, nothing would happen. You wait. And then the mother of all clunks comes along, thuds the car into reverse and it jolts backwards. It would stall at traffic lights. You couldn't pull up at traffic lights and keep your foot on the brake. It would stall. Um, that made me worry that it could be the torque converter or something along those lines or something in the actual gearbox. But I'm inclined to think the issue is the valve block. Um, the valve block, I shall show you in a minute, but the valve block is basically a little control gubbins thing which distributes hydraulic fluid to different parts of the gearbox and has solenoids in it which shut channels off and open channels up and that pressure of that fluid operates clutches and those clutches operate 
gear sets and that controls the speed you're going. I would have thought that it was a torque converter issue because of the stalling. However, it doesn't make sense. The first reason it doesn't make sense is because when the car is hotter, the gearbox fluid is thinner. And if the fluid was thinner, if anything, you'd be struggling to get any drive, not having it not be able to let go. Um, so that didn't make a lot of sense, although I am very much a novice on automatic gearboxes. But the other reason um, it didn't make sense is because on this car, when it comes to a standstill, when you're on the brakes, it takes itself out of gear. It's supposed to take itself out of gear and put itself into a neutral gear. Even if you haven't selected neutral on the shifter, it does it itself. And then when you take your foot off the brake or retouch the throttle, one of them, it will automatically go back into uh, drive mode. And of course, if the valve body was stuck and the, and the solenoids in it weren't shifting, then it wouldn't be able to, it would be stuck in drive and it would not like being held on the brake. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. But I only work four or five miles from my house and uh, on a one way journey, you can pretty much do the whole journey without an issue. It's, it doesn't warm up enough in that time, which isn't really a good thing for the car, but for the gearbox, it was fine. Um, I've since tried doing some fluid changes uh, to see if that helps. Flushing fluid all the way through needs a certain machine. Seven liters in the system, you can change about three just by draining and filling. And the logic is if you do that enough times, eventually you have performed a full flush. You can't empty the gearbox, there's stuff in the torque converter. Um, there's not a lot in it now. I reckon I've got about five liters out of it now. Yeah, there's bits in there that you can't get to unless you've got the equipment, which I do not. Um, I barely know how automatic gearboxes work, if I'm honest. So it's a bit silly to be uh, prattling around with it. But yeah, so since then, I've not had any cause to um, to not drive it because it was able to do the journey I did. And I did do one journey to Wickham, High Wickham, um, which is a bit of a trek from here. But on the motorway, or on the A3 and the M25, it wasn't going between gears. And because it wasn't going between gears, because the torque converter wasn't having to do much slippage, there wasn't much heat being produced. And because there wasn't much heat being produced, there wasn't really an issue with the gearbox. So you did find that if you did a longer journey, it was okay. Um, but the issues just got worse and worse and worse. Um, in fact, it got to a point where it was getting stuck in third gear, um, jammed in third gear at roundabouts. So you went to pull away and you couldn't because you were in third gear. And the torque converter was having a hellish time trying to deal with that. Other than that, um, for the journeys I've been doing, it's been fine. So the car went on the road from then until May 2021. In May 2021, um, I just bought a Citroen SM over there, which I may have mentioned. I also had that red BX Mark I, and that's when I bought that. Oh, spiders just landed on me. Oh, spider. I also uh, had the Mark I BX, and that's the car I put back on the road in May 2021 and gave this a break because on this a drive belt tensioner started making a hellish noise and I thought I do not want that coming off because that comes off that drive belt and Swiss cheeses the cam belt I'm in for a bad time so I'd elected to take car off the road save myself 50 quid a month and park it and it got parked for a long time um, in fact to be honest it got parked until about four weeks ago it didn't mean for that to happen and it didn't really get anything done with it it just kind of sat there in the background looking sad but that changed a little while back. A few weeks ago, I finally managed to get the chance to get the car in and I went to attend to the issues that I felt would prevent it getting an MOT. They were the advisories from the last MOT. So what I'm going to do now is edit in the footage and all the work that's been done on this car until this date that I have on video. I don't have all of it on video. The first bits I have um, where well, the gearbox suspension, blah, blah, that was all done before the channel started. So I've got some pictures, there were some forum threads, I'll, you know, I've stitched something together as you've seen. But now I've got the footage of doing the other bits. Things like um, the track rod end and the CV boot, end, changing the drive shaft, um, all sorts of stuff, including fitting poly bushes to it, race car. And then after that, whether it's this video, I don't know how it's going to edit out yet, but whether it's this one or the next one or the next whatever, then we'll get back to where we are now, what I'm doing today, why it's on the ramp now. And uh, yeah, we'll see where we go with it. Look, it's covered in Saharan dust. That's bits of the Sahara Desert. I don't want to wash it off because it's cool. But it's not cool, it's hot. 
Sitten 